Hello and welcome to the episode 110 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. Today, among other things, we have an irate letter, several studio sessions, and an unseen scene. On the 28th of April 1961, the Beatles received a harshly worded letter from Alan Williams, who acted as their de facto manager during part of 1960, threatening payback if they didn't pay him the customary commission for their current residence in Hamburg, West Germany. In all fairness, the agreement between Williams and the Beatles had always been unwritten. What's more, the band had stopped employing Williams' services for months, finding and negotiating gigs on their own, including their second visit in Hamburg. Peter Eckhorn, owner of the Top Ten Club, and their friend Stu Sutcliffe, who had settled in the city in 1960, helped solving all the bureaucratic problems, and Williams had no part in the whole affair. Requiring payment for work he had not done was rather cheeky, but nothing terribly uncommon. Managers used to take advantage of their customers in the 1950s and early 1960s. In any case, the lads kept their performance schedule at a top 10 club without missing a beat. One year later, in 1962, Pete Best, George Harrison, John Lennon and Paul McCartney enjoyed their only day off of their third stint in Hamburg. 1963, the Beatles were on the stage of the Mercy View Pleasure Grounds Ballroom in Frodsham. Despite being only a small town in Cheshire, the ballroom was a popular destination for touring bands at the time. On the 20th of April 1964, Paul McCartney was at the Jack Billings TV School of Dancing to film his own solo sequence for a hard day's night. The sequence saw Paul, looking for Ringo, finding himself in a rehearsal room, talking with an actress, Isla Blair, who had been practicing her lines. The scene was cut from the final edit of the film because it wasn't convincing enough. At the end of the day, McCartney offered Isla Blair a lift home in his car. When they went outside, they were quickly surrounded by girls. Quoted in Beatlesbible.com, Blair remembers, I was completely unprepared for how frightening it was. It must have been awful for him. They were grabbing at him and they were very vicious with me. They pulled my hair, they scratched me, they pulled me, they punched me, they pinched me, and it was horrible. John, George and Ringo enjoyed a day of rest. Meanwhile, George Martin and his crew produced mono and stereo mixdowns for a hard day's night, working at the EMI studios between 2 and 3.15 pm. More filming in 1965, with the Beatles resuming their working schedule at the Twickenham Film Studios after an Easter break. The filming of Help, today, had the band busy filming several sequences, including the one in which the thugs try to get hold of Ringo's ring from inside a mailbox. Talking about mailboxes, I should like to receive some of your comments about this series. Feel free to drop me a line about what you like or dislike about my work. Constructive criticism is well accepted, as I would not be able to progress and improve without it. And since we added it, why not taking a minute to visit www.simonmas.com support and see what you can do to help me to put out more music-related content. Be fab and make the difference. Thank you! On the 20th of April 1966, the Beatles started recording two new songs in a 12-hour session in Abbey Road, starting at 2.30 pm. John Lennon's And Your Bird Can Sing took the bulk of the attention with two rhythm tracks. They featured a 12-string guitar part inspired by the work of the birds and were almost completed if it wasn't for the lead vocal part which John and Paul couldn't put down the tape without laughing. Two mono mixes were completed before the end of the session, 
and the second, deemed best, was released on the Anthology 2 album in 1996. In addition, four practice takes of George Harrison's Taxman, to a which incomplete, were consigned to tape before the session was wrapped up at 2.30 am. One year later, in 1967, the reprise of Surgeon Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band was mixed in stereo between 5 and 6.15 pm by Jeff Emerick and tape operator Richard Lush. George Martin arrived with the Beatles at 7 pm to work on Only a Northern Song, erasing some of the material recorded along take 3 on the 13th of February and overdubbing a bass, a trumpet and a glockenspiel, reducing and mixing down the material onto take 11 and adding vocals. The producers of the Yellow Submarine film, for which the song was destined, were present in the studio, but they were not particularly impressed by Paul McCartney's trumpet playing. The session was wrapped up at 2.15 am. Another mixing and recording session took place on the 20th of April 1969, with the Beatles and Billy Preston working at the EMI studios between 7 pm and 12.45 am. With George Martin's protege Chris Thomas again in the producer's seat, they overdubbed a Hammond organ part and some conga drums on I Want You, She's So Heavy. Then, turning on another unused piece that has surfaced during the Get Back sessions, the band recorded 26 takes of the rhythm track of Oh Darling, I'll Never Do You No Harm, which would soon lose the subtitle in parentheses. A Hammond organ track was overdubbed onto take 26, and then the session was wrapped up with a stereo mix of this second song. And with this, my only remaining task for the day is to remind you to tune in tomorrow for another episode of What A Fab Day, featuring the proper recording of Taxman, among other things. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.